Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm with Moffitt Library. We're joined by Laura Nichols, the longtime uh, art educator at the Desmond campus, uh, to explore some of the work of Leonardo da Vinci, the great polymath and um, Italian Renaissance artist. Uh, so thank you once more for joining us. And Laura Nichols, uh, please take it away. OK, well, thank you. And uh, David will be operating the um... Uh, the slides, so um, I'm, you know, I'll, I'll be just saying change, so he knows when to change change the slides. So, so in my very long years of teaching, um, for the most part, when I started my art appreciation class for the seniors, can you go back, David? Yeah. So I started with this painting, and and most of you will know it. It's the creation of Adam by Michelangelo, and I'd ask them to look at the painting and talk about it and tell me what they see. Change, please. Dave. And then I, I put this painting up. Uh, and again, it's a painting that you all are familiar with. And change, please. And then we'd, we'd look at them together. And um, we talk about the comparisons and contrasts. And, and we talk about the beginning of humanism and talk about the differences basically between them. Whereas the Michelangelo um, painting on the bottom, um, you know, the true meaning of one of the true meanings of, of um, uh, the, the high Renaissance in particular was human, human emotion, it was the intellect, it was um, this idea of, of understanding. Um, and it was also um, uh, a, a, an, an understanding where you could relate to images and make some kind of context with that. Um, with, the, with the Da Vinci painting, it's much more structure, structured, uh, very rigid. But as we'll see, there, is a, there was a method to the, to the structure. Um, it was based on geometry. It was based on um, the, high, the high concepts of, of the high Renaissance. Um, you notice that the two, color, the two colorations are very different um, uh, and both have been heavily restored. But uh, you know, there's more subtlety to, to, the, to the image. Um, and, you know, also it is, it's, it's, you know, Da Vinci is, is very structured where it's, it takes a, an intellect, it takes a stronger intellect to really kind of get down to the meat and potatoes of the story. Whereas the Michelangelo uh, 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 birth um, creation of Adam is that meeting of the eyes and the almost touching of the fingers that really creates this powerful sense of emotion. So today we're gonna to take a, a little look at the, uh, some of, a few of the voluminous works of Leonardo da Vinci. Change please, Dave. And so uh, Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci was born in a, a village about two miles outside of, uh, of uh, Vinci um, on uh, Anchera, and it was in the hills of Tuscany. And he was um, born to a governmental uh, notary uh, official um, who had a fairly high standing in the province, and in, and uh, you know basically a washerwoman mistress. And because of that, you know um, Leonardo was a bastard, and he had no, you know, he was totally illegitimate. But he was raised by his father and his stepmother. And so as a young boy, um, as a young boy, he used to take paper, which was very, which is a very high cost commodity from his father and begin to draw. And, you know, from a very early age, he, was, he would go around the village and the town and just draw, draw, draw everything that, I, that he saw. So the images that you're looking at on the bottom right is Tuscany. It's the hills of Tuscany. If you've ever been there, they're they're dry, they're mountainous, they're very, very beautiful. Um, the hills are dotted with medieval towns that high, have high towers. In the medieval days, um, each town was its own like city state and uh, had its own um, uh, governmental operation. Um, so there was a lot of turmoil between in, in, in between the towns. So warfare was always on the mind of the notaries or the, or the um, politicians that lived in the villages. And on the bottom left in Anciano, you see this little stone cottage that they believe was the birthplace of a, a very young Leonardo. In, 18, in the 1870s, Telemachus Signorini uh, created a, like a travelogue of many 
books of many um, you know locations within the um, within Tuscany and within Italy, and he wrote Gita a Vinci, which means you know like a, a trip to Vinci, and it was at that first you know that first juncture with drawings and watercolors because he was an artist as well. He kind of gave us a very a very good indication of what Vinci would have looked like perhaps up until about the mid 19th century. Change please. So when a young Leonardo was maybe 12 or 11, he had collected this whole portfolio of drawings and his father who realized that because Leonardo was an illegitimate child, he could never go to university, but he had an artistic skill. So he moved the family to Florence for, for the moment and he went to one of the um, one of the prime artistic workshops of artists in Florence. And and Florence at this time it was in the in the fifteenth century. Um, uh, Florence was one of the the high centers of the beginnings of the Renaissance. It had the great Medici money. It had all of the uh, you know the artistic uh, beginnings of. Uh, you know, the classic looking at classical art and interpreting them through a more realistic or humanistic, uh, you know, vision. And um, and, Verrocchio and Andrea Verrocchio was one of the prime artists in, in Florence at the time. And so Verrocchio looked at the portfolio of drawings as it's, as you know, it was noted in Vasari, who was the great uh, chronicler of, of the Renaissance. Uh, Verrocchio looked at his drawings and said, we have a true genius here. And so it was from that juncture, which is in about the early 1870s, that uh, a young Leonardo began a 10 year tenure as an apprentice with Verrocchio. And what that means is, and you know, rather, uh, you know, Leonardo couldn't go to university, but he went to, he went to study art and all phases of art and the production of art under a master. And he wasn't the sole one, you know, wasn't the sole student in the studio. There were several artists who went on to, you know, to um, various, uh, you know, artistic productions, but he was, he was extremely gifted. So one of the things that, uh, you know, being an apprentice in a studio like that or into, you know, in a workshop like that was that you learn all the aspects of drawing, all the aspects of the understanding of the tr three-dimensional realities of the human form, the gestures, um, the you know the musculature, um, you know just the sensitivity of light and dark, and how to display emotions and gestures. You also you also uh, learn the art of sculpture, and and for the most part in this case, sculpture. Uh, was for the glory of the aristocrats or for the glory of the church. And many of these sculpts were done, um, uh, you know, the way they created them is they created clay uh, maquettes that were cast in wax and then they would be cast in bronze. And that was the process. So, you know, the students, the apprentices would have learned all of that process. And then they also would have learned the process of painting. And painting in particular, um, you know, just, uh, you know, just until the beginning of the, the, um, uh, the, the, the 15th century, 14th, 15th century, primarily was the painting of frescoes, was the painting in tempera, um, was not really using oil paints uh, per se, um, but there were paintings, paintings where you'd have to learn how, the, you know, the elements of composition and, and the elements of how to tell a story through visual imagery. And then you also learned about where do you put these paintings? And for the most part, most of the paintings were, were done in the production of the church. So these paintings would have been part of altarpieces or, uh, you know, pro, um, like, uh, um, you know, trans, uh, transporting altars, little, you know, double altars, triple altars, um, but they would be done for the, for the religious as well as, as the, um, uh, the, the secular. So one of the earliest documented pieces that Leonardo would have worked on was a piece that was done in Verrocchio's studio where Verrocchio designed the composition. He created, he created the composition and the whole story of that, uh, laid it all out, started to do the painting and then let his apprentices more or less finish the work. And in, in, it's documented that in this particular painting in the baptism of Christ, Leonardo created the angel to the very left-hand side. And what you could see, if you look very carefully at the angel's face, you could see that the angel's face, the young, you know, the young uh, child almost has a very sympathetic or very humanistic face. Whereas you look at the, the, the little figure next to him and you look at the, the attempt at trying to make a perspective of a figure looking up, it's, it's much harder. And then if you look at the, at the figure of 
Christ and you look at the figure of John the Baptist there and you look at their figures themselves, they look very static and very wooden. Um, you know, they almost, they almost have the, like a lifeless appearance. So the documentation of how um, Leonardo got his start is working as an apprentice and working with a, an instructor. And so what he said, and, and some of the things he said during this period, he said, so I couldn't go to university. They don't know anything anyway. I would rather learn nature and from experience than some boring professor. And he also talked about, he also talked about how copying, and again, he was worked as an apprentice, how copying was an essential aspect of education. The artist ought to first exercise his hand by copying drawings from the hand of a good master, in this case, Verrocchio. And having acquired that practice under the criticism of his master, he should next practice drawing objects in relief of a good style, following the rules which will presently be given. Meanwhile, you're working under the master, Verrocchio, you're, under, you're, you're working with him, you're learning from him, and then you know, you're, you're ready to move on to the next, uh, you know, to the next phase. Next, please. So over the course of, of um, uh, Leonardo's life, he created hundreds and hundreds of notebooks. He was a copious admirer of nature. He drew all the time. He wanted to capture the essence of whatever it is he was drawing. Um, and he wanted to be basically, uh, you know, basically, basically become conversant with the elements of nature. Next, please. He, al he also spent countless hours on the drawing of drapery and in his, you know, in his, particularly in his apprentice days, because he thought, and as artists thought, that it taught one the importance of patience, of the values of light and dark, so you could get that three-dimensional aspect there, and structure, so that, that you couldn't get just with a simple line drawing. So he became a master of drapery as well, which then served him in much of his paintings. But, and he said with this, many are they who have a taste and love for drawing, but no talent. And this will be discernible in the boys who are not diligent and never finish their drawings with shadings. Next, please. One of the things that uh, Leonardo was most taken with throughout his life was birds and the idea of flight. And he documented bird flight. He documented the wingspans and, and the birds in movement. And then he went on to create hundreds of, of inventions, uh, particularly for the war machine, for the great rulers, particularly in Milan and, and then Florence, which um, uh, never came to fruition. But he was an engineer and he more or less understood the mechanics of nature and then transcribe them into mechanical means so that they could be created into machinery. Next, please. And then there's, there's musculature, um, muscles and the anatomy. And he said, he said this, it, it is a necessary thing for a painter in order to be able to fashion limbs correctly in the positions and actions which they can represent in the nude know that they know the, uh, the anatomy of sinews, bones, muscles, and tendons in order to know the various different movements and impulses which cause the movement. And so with this, he was able then to kind of finagle his way into the morgues in which he began copious studies of the human body and the human form by you know, carefully lifting the, the layers of skin off of the cadavers. Now, by the way, this was, was not looked at um, uh, you know, very highly in the, in the Catholic church. So all of this had to be done in secret. And if you notice that there's writing on these drawings, again, these were private diaries, private journals of which he kept, kept many. And he would write, as mo many of you know, he would write backwards and in, in reverse order. And the reason he did that was because if he he would be severely prosecuted by the church, uh, because these were these these type of drawings were very anti-church, and he would be you know severely prosecuted. So when he did these drawings in his his uh, diaries, he would write so that nobody would be able to understand them. But he was perfectly capable in writing so that he could be understood, providing that the uh, you know the documentation or the the, the letter or whatever he was writing. Was, was going to go to someone that wouldn't have any prosecution. Next, please. And then he also worked with 
the pregnant women and the, the birth of the body. Now, this also was very revolutionary during the Renaissance and during Leonardo's time, because you know before this there was no knowledge of the you know the the actual birth and the birth process. So this too was you know quite revolutionary for his time in the late 1400s. Next, please. And then there's the facial figures. And the facial figures uh, was something that he delighted in. And the idea of, of, of the faces and the, you know, the, this, this capturing a personality, um, he wanted to get the, capture the expression of the face, make himself familiar with the variety of forms that the face took in the, you know, in the sequence of age or in the sequence of, of uh, you know, talking or you know, talking within people. Um, so, you know, he, he said there of, of noses, and if you look at that middle drawing, there are 10 types of, of noses, straight, bulbous, hollow, prominent, above or below the middle, aquiline, uh, regular, flat, round, you know, and so he, he observed, he was the great observer. And he would then, you know, by doing this, he would also then do, if you look up in the top left there, he would also document and really explore the proportions of the human face, as well as, um, you know, as well as the gestural quality of the emotions. Next, please. And then the gestures and the gestures represent and all these different representations almost as an act of speaking because mind you you know these visual images don't have words to accompany with them accompany them particularly if they're, if they're done on altar pieces or done uh, you know in, in two-dimensional reality so they have the gestures have to accompany good words or good works in the same way that a person, when looking at them, they would understand what the depiction of what the person was all about or what he was, you know, what the nature of the person was really all about. And so you'll see this in several of the, the you know, you see several of these same hand positions in some of the paintings that we looked, uh, looked out, we will look out of. And so he, he thought that if the person was deprived of hearing, he would able, someone would be able to understand from the attitudes and the gestures of the speakers or the visual images, the nature of the person's discussion or the nature of what was going on in the, in the painting. Next, please. And then we come to the Vitruvian man. And the Vitruvian man is actually a, a very small drawing. It's only nine by 13. And um, he, he, he started off with this premise, which was basically came from a, 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 a first or second century writing of Vitruvio, a Roman, a Roman scholar. And he said, how can you take the area of a circle and create the square within an equal area? And so Vitruvius thought that if you took a compass and stuck it in the belly button of a, a person, then you would be able to, you know, get the pro the belly button would then be the, the proper measure of the center of man, the center of a person. So if you take a compass and put, put it on a fixed point, you could draw a circle and then you can draw, you can then create the square within it. Well, da Vinci used the Vitruvian ideas, these ideas to solve the problem of squaring off the circle. And as you can see, uh, you know, to get ba basically down to the, 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 in the, the act, actual aspect of what the Vitruvian man is all about, that if a, a, fu a, a fully grown adult is standing two feet on the ground, the height from his the base of his feet to the top of his head will be the exact distance. And if he extended the arms, uh, you know, arms out straight ahead, so that would then form the square. So the Vitruvian man. Um, you know, also put man in the place in the chain of the center of, of you know, the, of the world, um, which was very important, um, you know, within the course of the Renaissance, because the humans have the mortal body accompanied by an immortal soul, and it's the universe divided exactly in a half. So again, this is all the idea of creating proportion and understanding the rules of proportion. Next, please. So the Annunciation. All right, so the Annunciation, um, the Annunciation is uh, the, um, the story of when the angel Gabriel comes to Mary to tell Mary um, that she will then bear the Christ child. And starting at the early Renaissance, um, and you'll see those three images down at the bottom, Giotto, Frangelico, and then French uh, Campion, um, the, the Annunciation scene was pictured primarily in what's called a hortus conclusus. And that, 
cortis conclusus means it's an enclosed garden. And that refers to the purity or the, the virginity of Mary. And so if you can see in the two lower, the, well, all three of them, um, in the two lower left ones, Mary and the angel comes to Mary in a loggia, like an outside like porch, if you will. Um, in the Campion one, the angel comes to Mary in a, in a room. In the two lower left ones, um, the Giotto and the Frangelico, Mary is sitting in, in, in chastity, her hands are crossed over her chest. Um, the angel comes, hands are crossed over the chest. And so the compositions are very similar. And the Campion one on the lower right, it's a, quite a bit different because the angel comes to Mary who is in a room, she's reading uh, the Bible or passages of the Bible that shows her intelligence. Um, and there's all kinds of symbols that allude to the, uh, to the passion or to the, the future life of Christ, the life and death of Christ. But what do we see in Da Vinci's? Well, uh, this is uh, apparently the, uh, one of the earliest paintings that uh, uh, Da Vinci worked on primarily by himself, but he was still under the, you know, the apprenticeship of Verrocchio. And you see that, that the angel comes to Mary, she's sitting on a bench um, with, within the garden. Um, she has her hands on a book, which if you can take a look to the right of the painting, so you see, uh, you know, very similarly, she's turning the pages of the Testament, the Old Testament, the angel comes, and what you can't see is very clearly that in the angel's left hand, she's holding a white lily, which is a, a symbol of purity. She comes to tell Mary that she will bear, Christ, uh, bear a child, and the child would be born. Um, you also see that there's, the figures are very solid. Um, there's shadows on the grass. So that, that gives us an idea that it's, it's true, it's real. Um, the wings of the angel were based on the mighty bird of, you know, mighty birds of prey. Um, so you see all of these uh, figures that are, are represented in a traditional Annunciation composition. However, this composition, Mary is in the outdoors, not within the confines of a room or the confines of a loggia. And so you see her in a garden and, and the, you know, the flower is very similar to the merely flurry of medieval, of medieval tapestries and all that. All of those flowers would have had some type of symbolic meaning, um, but you also see a Mary that doesn't show any emotion, that her hand is raised. She, she looks at the angel, the angel is bowed down. Um, there is some communication that is going on, but um, the, the communication is one of more of a spiritual aspect than a verbal aspect there as well. Um, so Leonardo in this painting captured a combination of nature and narrative that uh, he, he, you know, he took from you know, his predecessors, but then brought, brought it up to another step by including it in uh, you know, an, out, an outside situation. Um, so he said with landscape, and you begin to see how he approached landscape within the backdrop of this painting, not so much as the um, you know, the silhouetted images of the, the pine type of non-deciduous trees. But if you look to the mountains and then the, you know, the, the, of, um, dis the mountains in the distance. And he said, he said about landscape, he said, I cannot forbear to mention among these precepts, a new device for study. Although it may seem trivial and ludicrous, it's nevertheless useful in arousing the mind to various inventions. If you have to devise a scene, you may discover a resemblance to various landscapes beautified with mountains and rivers and rocks and trees and plains and wide valleys and hills in a varied arrangement. He made them up, but he, and you know, because of the architecture within where he lived between in Tuscany and Florence and then eventually Milan, but he made them up in order to become the most ideal, the most perfect landscape. Um, so next please. And so we have the Ginevra de Benci. And the Ginevra de Benci, we're looking at a young woman that's 16 years old. Her name was uh, Ginevra de Benci. Um, she has flawless, uh, you know, flawless white skin, porcelain features. Uh, she has a reserved countenance to her and almost like an impenetrable expression. She's not cracking a smile or doing anything else. And that goes to show of the refinement of this young woman. Um, so, and like most portraits uh, that were painted during this particular time, 
they were painted by wealthy patrons. And that would indicate that she not only was wealthy, but she came from a well-educated family. And she uh, herself, Ginevra, was known as a poet and a learned conversationalist. So she was very well respected among the families, the noted families in Florence. And um, I want you to look closely at her herself because here you get the understanding of what virtue is, particularly in a young woman. And that was very important um, in the portrayal uh, of female females, young females in the Renaissance was virtue. Virtue was prized and guarded. It was a girl's beauty was thought to be a sign of goodness. So take a look at her face. One of the symbols of virtues or one of the, you know, the most apparent symbols of virtues is her high forehead. Um, and so in order to attain that high forehead, um, her, her um, ladies in waiting would have plucked her hair out in order to, to show this high forehead, which would have given an indication of knowledge and intelligence. You also notice there are very, very little, you know, little indication of eyebrows. Um, a, a, a portraitist or a, a painter who was painting a portrait were expected to enhance a woman's beauty or attractiveness according to the standards of beauty. Now, one of the possibilities of why this painting was painted, this too, uh, is that she was commissioned, uh, it was commissioned on the occasion of her betrothal and she was 16 years old. She eventually within that same year married a, a, a man of high standing, Luigi Nicolini. And then a second possibility is um, there was a platonic love affair going on with a, a gentleman that was much older than her, but then he was be, she would be someone that would be by his side. And again, a person of wealth and stature. Um, so she was said both as a poet and as a young woman to inspire poetry, to inspire love. And da Vinci says about her, if the poet says that he can inflame men with love, the painter has the, uh, has the power to do the same. And in that he can place in front of the lover the true likeness of the one who is beloved, often making him kiss and speak to it, meaning the portrait. On the reverse side of the portrait, there is this little, this little vignette that, um, that says, uh, it talks about virtue. It's virtue for, for decoration there. And in the, uh, in the decoration, I'll point out a couple of things that really have direct relationship to her purity, to her chastity, and to uh, Ginevra as well. And it, be, it is actually a wreath of laurel on the left, palm on the right, and juniper uh, with a scroll, scroll, scroll inscribed um, on the reverse, virtutem forma decorate, which is truth and beauty. And so the central juniper, the centerpiece in the cent in there, uh, juniper, or which is called Ginepro in Italian, is a, a combination of Ginevra's name, therefore her symbol, and it re represents chastity. The palm on the right stands for moral virtue, while the laurel on the left indicates artistic and literal, literal or, you know, uh, poetic inclinations. So just those symbols alone indicate the sitter's uh, virtuosity, poetic beauty, and all of her, her all of her love uh, there as well. And so Leonardo was 21 when he painted this, and he, uh, one of his contemporaries wrote of the painting that, quote, he painted Ginevra with such perfection that it seemed to be not a portrait but Ginevra herself. So it was all about this lifelike forthright portrayal, which had literally broken all the conventions of the earlier Renaissance uh, painting and then Renaissance portraiture of woman. And so real, it really is a, you know, it's a document to that. And then the, the last thing you should notice is that it's one of the first of the three quarter views of a portrait. For the most part during the Renaissance, view, portraits were frontal, or they were silhouette. And here Leonardo paints a three quarter view because he wanted to show more of the face. Um, the eyes view are, are viewing directly out out, you know, looking out. And so therefore it indicates the, the planes of face and the face itself is very subtly modeled. Um, so it has that come to life uh, virtue so that he so wanted to show. Next, please. He painted in, uh, you know, just after leaving Verrocchio's studio um, and, you know, basically starting off on his own, he painted a series of Madonnas, of which these three are primarily the three that are most noted. The Benoit Madonna, or, or it's known as the Madonna and Child with the Flowers, is um, 
you know, it's the first documented work, work that he painted apart from Verrocchio. And so in that painting, what you, what you should look at, and you, you, you can compare the three, but what you should look at is how the painting is set up. She's, uh, the, the Madonna and child is set up in a dark room with one window that serves to highlight the Madonna and child itself. The Virgin is seated on the bench with uh, the Christ child seated on her lap. Her face is young and lively, even though the expression looks a little weird, but um, she is clothed in dark garments in the olive and brown coloring, perhaps is not a, a wealthy kind of garment there, um, covers her knees, so she is totally covered there. The Christ child is very chubby, is very ample, and he holds a branch of flowers which also the Virgin is holding, with also Mary is holding. And that branch of flowers, you can't really tell, but that branch of flowers is, is created in a cruciform you know, uh, direction there. And that is to indicate, um, that's to indicate the future, you know, that Christ will die on the course there. And so that was, again, that was a pretty common thing, late Middle Ages and into the Renaissance, to have uh, symbols that would be within the painting so that they could be read uh, as a, um, you know, as motifs in understanding the painting. The second painting is the Madonna of the Carnation, and you'll have to look for the Carnation. I'll tell you where it is. Um, so again, you have in the center of the composition. Now you know she's truly in the center because of the placement of the windows, right? And here she takes the central position. She takes a triangular position, which was becoming very popular with the Neoplatonic ideals of the Renaissance, as far as the pinnacle of importance being the top of the, uh, you know, the top of the uh, um, uh, uh, triangle or, or the pyramid and then works down to, to hold it in weight. So here she, uh, Mary is depicted in lovely clothes and very strong colors with beautiful jewelry and brooches. In her left hand, Mary holds a carnation and you have to look for it. So if you see the brooch on her dress and you look just to the left of that, you'll see this little red disc um, and that's the carnation. Well, the red, the red carnation is emblematic of Christ's blood and the, 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 the flower itself is covered by the shadow. The child is looking up and the mother is looking down, but there is no eye contact. And so, you know, there is, you know, again, there's this, this, this kind of ethereal approach to the virgin and child. All right. And what you should also notice is the background beyond the window. And you have more of this mysterious kind of mountain scenery that, um, that uh, you know, again, alludes to some type of a mystical play. The third painting is called the Madonna Lita. And, um, and it was done probably about 10 or 12 years after the first two paintings, which he more or less apparently was working on together for various clients. And so um, the, the, again, it's a Christ, uh, you know, it's a virgin and child there. And it's, um, it is called that, um, in the Madonna Lita because it refers to Madonna, the Madonna feeding the Christ child. Um, so um, he is he's feeding from his mother, but in his left hand, if you look really carefully, you'll notice that there is a little goldfinch and the goldfinch is another symbol of the future passion. So again, these symbols, as well as the sumptuousness really gives us an indication of his clientele who he's working for. Next, please. Okay, so again, now he's, he's off on his own. He's starting to get great commissions from the church, uh, from various churches. And he paints these two paintings of the same composition with minor changes um, for, uh, you know, one is in the National Gallery in England and one is in the Louvre, um, but they're called the Virgin of the Rocks. And if you recall from the previous Madonna and Child or, you know, the, those, those symbols, those paintings there, all of those paintings were painted inside. All, and in those paintings, in the Madonna and Child paintings, Mary was sitting on a chair. Most of the representations of Mary would be, Mary would be queen of heaven. She would be sitting on some type of a chair or throne. Um, but for this first, for the first time, uh, Leonardo moved the whole setting outside. And so she, Mary is not sitting on a chair, but she's sitting on the ground. And that's referred to as Mary of humility. Um, and here she is, she is um, the, or the Madonna of humility, and she has 
and both of the images, but we'll look at the, the one on, on the right and, and then the left. She has uh, her right arm around um, St. John the Baptist, who is making a gesture of prayer to the Christ child who is on the left. Um, no, he's on the right. And he, the Christ child is holding his hand up in benediction. Uh, so, he, so he blesses St. John's. Mary's hand, her left hand, hovers over, over the Christ child's head as in protection. And then the angel who is on the right, the figure on the right, in the, in the left-hand painting, the Virgin, Virgin, Virgin of the Rocks, she's pointing to St. John the Baptist. And the figures and, and the other one, in the other painting, you can't really see her hand, but you know, it's, it's there, but it's not as obvious as in the left-hand painting. In both paintings, and it's the handling and the coloration that, they, that he used, um, in both paintings, they are, located in this mystical, magical, fabulous type of landscape that rivers seem to go nowhere and you can follow them up into these magical mountains. And there's these bizarre rock formations um, that more or less recall, or as it's, it's told, recall, recalls the Dolomiti Mountains, which is in Northern Italy, Northeastern Italy. And so in the foreground, as in the, um, the Annunciation, you see these meticulous uh, rendered plants and flowers and and again this was one of his one of his things that he 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 was very particular with the rendition of plants and flowers and nature um so you, you wonder about how he gets across this point about ideal divinity and leonardo found another way to indicate divinity by giving the 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 characters, the figures, ideal beauty and grace. So these are very graceful Marys. And, um, you know, so the, the landscape, you see the landscape, you see the depth of perspective, you see the triangular motion, the triangular, um, you know, composition there. Uh, so it is this fluidity and this movement that was such a break from some of the, and, and just think back to Verrocchio, these very stiff figures, that was such a break that was moving him into a, a figure of the high Renaissance. So um, I want you to just take a look at one more thing. And in the first painting that was done, Virgin of the Rocks on the left-hand side, you see Mary, if you look very closely around her head, she has a nimbus, which is very difficult to see. Um, the, uh, and in, uh, in the right hand side, you see it a little bit better. Apparently, apparently, uh, Leonardo had started the painting on the left, but was very slow to come, you know, to finish the painting. And, you know, the, the, um, the, the church that, or, you know, the, the group that had requested this painting wanted it, wanted it, wanted it. And so he created a second painting. So several features, um, you know, in the altarpiece were left out. Next, please. The Lady with the Ermine, and, and, and this is, this is a, an interesting painting because it wasn't painted for a church. Uh, at the end of the 1880s, as you'll see in a few seconds there, uh, in the 1480s, Leonardo left Florence where he had lived for 10 or 12 years and had been working for the Medici family and had been working for some of the great churches, you know, doing these altarpieces and, um, you know, doing a great, a great amount of work. But Ludovico Sforza had summoned him, as well as many other artists, you'll see in the next slide, had summoned him up to, to Milan. And the Sforza family were the great benefactors. They were the rulers of Milan. Um, so one of the, one of the earliest uh, uh, projects that, he, that uh, Leonardo was commissioned to do was to paint this painting, um, which was the 16-year-old mistress of uh, Ludovico Sforza. And it takes on, and you know, it has these interesting objects within the painting, which again, more or less leads us to an interpretation of the painting there. The woman's name is Cecilia Gallerani. She was 16 years old. As we look at the painting, she is again in three quarter view. However, her body and her head are going opposite directions, but she peers off to her left, to our right, as if she's caught by something that was happening outside of the painting's frame. And she bears, she takes this look of knowing. She doesn't lose any of her concentration. Um, and she just more or less looks outside the frame. Her smile is slightly coy and it seems to more or less indicate that she knows the position 
her position at the court. She's 16 years old. And, and you know, the knowledge and the power of her beauty within the court itself. Now, she holds an ermine, which is the bearer of fur that was used in Swartz's coat of arms. However, the ermine, the ermine um, was uh, Svorza's not only, you know, in his coat of arms, but he was labeled as the white ermine because um, he was, you know, decorated by the King of Naples as into the order of the ermine. And so the ermine, oddly enough, the ermine is a symbolic, was considered a, a symbol of purity and chastity, but in the arms of Svorza's mistress, the ermine, you know, takes on another another indication there as well. So, so you have this, uh, you know, you have this painting that here she is, this very beautiful young woman that has this knowledge of power. Her virtue, you know, is, is a little bit questionable. But if you take a look at her face and her eyebrows and the hair and all of that, um, you know, even though she is uh, the mistress of Sforza, she does have that you know, that virtue of being the only mistress. But what really puzzles me, and I couldn't really find very much documentation about that, is her hand. And her hand is very large within the relationship to the rest of her body. Here she is a very delicate woman, and she has this, um, you know, this very, very large, um, you know, very large hand there. One of the uh, uh, contemporary critics says, his name is Sam Leith, he says, give the painting a really good look closely look and you'll see she really does have the breath of life in her but she's just distracted by a noise and it's caught in a living moment and that was one of the the, the really important aspects of how da Vinci developed as a painter as an artist as a representation of of emotions there as well next please so I mentioned Ludovico Svorza. Svorza um, was the son of Francisco. His father was Francisco Svorza. And Svorza, Francisco, more or less built up the dynasty in Milan. And so Ludovico, who was called Il Moro because of his dark skin, so we refer to as the Vulcan, um, was very, very rich and very, very powerful. And one of the, you know, with his power, he wanted to, you know, make Milan a, a a, a cent, a more of a center of beauty. And so he started to bring artists and architects up to Milan to work for him. And so one of the things that he was doing at that point in time is that he, they were constructing the Milan Cathedral and he had wanted, you know, he had wanted the architects to, you know, to, to make it even more beautiful. And so, um, you know, Svorza, um, you know, summoned all these artists and architects. Leonardo, who again was fairly young, wrote a letter to uh, Ludovico and said, you know, I am, I am great at, I can design you any kind of machinery for your wars and I'm a great engineer and basically talked himself into a job, which never, never really saw any, you know, any fruition. But one of the earliest projects that he did when he was there was that he, uh, uh, Ludovico wanted to create a, um, a, a statue for his father. And one of the, the statue, uh, one of the statues was this massive bronze equestrian statues, uh, which, which of a horse. And that harkens back to the ancient Romans. And in the ancient Roman times, wh when they had the great Caesars, you know, the rulers, uh, Caesar Augustus, they would portray the Caesar on a horse. So it was a great, uh, it was a great symbol of power. So Leonardo came up with these, with these drawings. They were ready to, you know, they had the clay maquette made. They were ready to cast it. But then, um, but then the, uh, the, there was a great French conflict. And so those plans were put on hold because the 75 tons of bronze that was needed to cast the bronze equestrian statue was needed for uh, for guns and ammunitions and, and um, you know, all kinds of, of things that were going to take away from that. So that was put on hold. And apparently when the French came into the city, they used the, the clay maquette as target practice. So that was an, another failed project. But as you can see in Milan, uh, you know, pro, uh, 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 an equestrian statue was there made. Another of the projects that was, um, that was part of uh, the, the foresight of uh, Frederico was that there was a new Dominican convent in Milan, which Ludovico's father Francisco had built. And in these days, 
it was when you when you built something in honor of the church it was more or less a way of getting into the good graces getting into the good graces of the lord and then you know it was like indulgences so he had he had ordered this uh, church built and it, it, it's called the santa maria della grazia or holy mother of grace and and uh ludovico decided in 1492 that this church and the whole confines, if you look down at the bottom there, it was a whole monastic confine there with cloisters and all types of, of buildings there, would be the great location for the Sforza Mausoleum. And so, you know, the resting place for the House of Sforza. And so the, uh, you know, architects from around Italy were, were brought, so, you know, submitting plans and all of that. And the church itself, if you can see on the top, this is an old photo, but the church itself was very plain. And primarily, primarily why it was plain is that be, because on the outside, it's like the outside of the body, you are, you are plain. It's not until you go into the inside where you become holy and spiritual that the inside becomes decorated. And so the whole complex, um, the whole complex and the, the dome was eventually built and um, the whole complex was finished by an, uh, a, an, architect, an architect called Bramante. And Bramante went on to be one of the major architects of St. Peter's in Rome. Next, please. So we'll just go through this. Uh, I just want to lead up to the last supper. So one of the things, one of the parts of the convent that was absolutely necessary is, is a structure called the refectory. And the refectory is a place where the monks or the nuns come and eat their meals. And you come in, it's very not decorated. You come in, you eat your meal in silent or you say a pray, your prayer and that is it. And you know, from a very early era, this idea of the last supper of Christ was an important uh, you know, meditational aspect that would either be in a mausoleum or a church, or as we got into the Renaissance, in a refectory. So the earliest indications of what a last supper meal would look like would be on the top, uh, you know, from the Christian point of view, would be in the top. And that is in the, the, the Basilica of San Polinaire Nuova in, in Ravenna that was created in the sixth century. In, in mosaic. And so here you see an indication of what a Roman meal would have looked like, where they all were kind of sitting down on the ground and then kind of around the circular table. And on the table, you see fish. And that was indicative of the loaves and fishes. The next two, uh, two images were from the early, like the 13th and 14th century from Duccio and Giotto. And where you see a little bit more conventional Last Supper scene where all of the apostles and Christ are seated around the table with the nimbuses on sharing the Last Supper meal. Next, please. And then we get to the first refractory painting. And that was in, um, the, uh, by, by an artist called Castaño in the mid 15th century, 1447. He did two actually. Um, one is, uh, was part of a great, if you look off to the left here, you see this great big uh, tree of life uh, altar or, or wall fresco painting of which the, the Last Supper is down at the bottom. And that's the scene right down in the center there. And that was done in uh, the 1380s. So that was the end of the 14th century. But Castaño in the middle of the 15th century, 1447, was a, it was like a breakthrough. First of all, he created this fresco that looked as if we were in a room, because the, the whole room is, is um, you know, it's all painted decoration. There are no, there's no, this is actually one of the least visited places in all of Florence, in the uh, Santa Polonia in Florence. Um, so it's in the convent. You'll see that all of the figures are seated at one side of the table, and the figure is, uh, you know, the figure of Judas is in the front there as well. And so, the figures are in balance. You notice that all of the back decoration, it's like slabs of stone. So that adds to the architectural uh, architectural setting. Um, so St. John, St. John in this, in this uh, representation, St. John is the innocent slumber, which contrasts uh, Jude, uh, uh, Judas, the betrayer, you know, in the upright pose in the center there as well. So you have this, you have this very conventional Last Supper pose of um, the first of its kind in a refectory. And it can, you know, kind of combines the architecture with all these ornate sphinxes. And it was a very wealthy refectory at that, but that was in Florence. And so go, go ahead, please. 
Okay, so Sforza had this refractory built and had, uh, you know, the you know the very plain interior. Uh, on the left, you can see uh, uh, maybe an 18th century drawing of the construction of the, you know, the, the side view of the construction of the, the, uh, the refractory itself because of the scale. You can see the scale that it holds. You see the Sforza coat of arms at the top. You also see a door down at the bottom. And then above that door, you see the panel where the Last Supper was painted. Now, if you can imagine, there was three or four tables right in front of that. And the, and the, the religious would be sitting at the tables, gazing up at the Last Supper, because it would be a virtual looking up at, gazing up, meditating on the last meal. Um, but the interesting part was, or one of the interesting parts is that although the, the figures were sitting at tables, when Leonardo painted the image, image as if we were straight, we were standing in front of the table. So the perspectival image is, is a little bit off. On the ap absolute opposite end of the refectory, as they would do in many churches on the Western end, would be a crucifixion, in this particular case, crucifixion scene that was done about the same time as the, the Last Supper. And it was done by, you know, minor artist Montesano. And again, that would be something where as you're walking out of the structure, something to meditate uh, on again, and that would be the last moments of Christ's life. Okay, next please. And then we get to the painting itself, and we're going to look at it in various different ways. So the 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 uh, the painting itself, compositionally, was designated or designed with the most prudent elements of perspective. And you could see at the the drawing down at the bottom, Christ is the center. Again, he takes that pyramidal form. His head is at the apex, the most important part of the of the um, composition, or the most important part of the triangular form. The hands, the outstretched hands form the base or form the balance of the composition. All of the lines that you see from the top and as well as some on the bottom all converge to a point behind Christ's head. So that then also um, creates a, a greater sense of importance there where there is no, uh, you know, that everything points down through one point perspective points to Christ, who is the main, main focus of the composition. What is very difficult to see, and let's go to the next slide. Um, you know, Christ then becomes the dynamic center. What's very difficult to see, if you remember the Vitruvian man, if you look above Christ's head, you can see the very faint outline of a circle. If you would take a compass and create a circle with that, you would also find that Christ, the center of Christ's head, would be the center of that compass circle. You also notice that there's three, three windows, the Trinity, the largest of the windows is, you know, is the backdrop for, for Christ. You'll notice that, um, you'll notice that all of, uh, you know, he becomes the dynamic center of the composition of the one point perspective. What I've done is I've, I've, of created, and I will tell you about each of the figures here, um, so that you can understand that even though Christ is the dynamic center, each of the 12 apostles are put into a group, and there's four groups of three. Now, the whole, the whole, um, you know, the whole basis of this composition is, or the, the, the basis of the story, is that Christ says to his apostles, one of you will betray me. And it's in those moments after that this scenario takes place. And so as the dynamic uh, center there, you have them into three. It's what Da Vinci used is that full range of emotions, facial, and the full range of hand gestures in order to play, in order to visually display the range of emotions. So on the left-hand group, the left-hand group forms the liveliest group because of their horror and detestation of the treachery of the traitor. On the right-hand side, which we'll take a look at in a second, is that there's all of these perfect emotions going on. And it's the thoughts, it's the dialogue that's going on, particularly in, in, within the groups. Okay, so let's take a look at, um, at, the, at the groups themselves. You also should notice there are no halos or nimbuses because it, it, you know, apparently he must have realized that if he would have put the nimbuses in, it would have detracted from the sense of emotions and the sense of the gestures that he was he was meant to uh, meant to talk about. So the uh, 
St. Saint Bartholomew. St. Saint Bartholomew is on the very left-hand side. He's leaning into the group. He has his right hand, you know, he's in a bent position. He has rests his right hand on the table, his on the bottom, which you can hardly see, his uh his his foot, his one foot is crossed over the other foot. And it's his he tries to hear what John, who is at the far end of the what the table, he's trying to hear what John will ask of Christ. James the less or James the minor, who is in the center, he's the youngest of uh, of the of the group, and he is uh, he is he is talking, he is talking, um, and he stands near and behind Saint Bartholomew. He lays his left hand on Peter's shoulder, which kind of stretches all the way out over there, and and just like Peter is saying, laying his hand on John's shoulder. And he, they're, they're looking for explanations. They're looking for what's going on, what's happening here. And Peter, Peter, who's, we'll look at him in a second, but Peter, you've got to look at that face because he, is, he threatens vengeance. He's really angry. Andrew is prominent because look at his hands. His hands are stretched up directly in front of him. And it's like, what's happening here? What's happening here? And it's expressed this belief, this disbelief that he, he, it's in horror and he doesn't, you know, this horror has seized, seized him. And um, we move on to, um, uh, to, to Peter, which is the figure that's bent over. Um, Peter is trying to hear and trying to figure out what's, what's going on. He's behind Judas. He's pictured as old. Um, he looks towards Jesus there. Um, he, he, it's like the devil took hold of him because he's got this terrible expression on his face. In his left hand, he, he seizes the right hand, the right shoulder of John, um, who bends towards him in this angular position there as well. And, and he looks towards Christ and asks in, in, you know, visually, who is the traitor? So he's looking at this, trying to, to, uh, to do that. And then he's also holding in his right hand, a knife. And that knife, is pointing to a Saint Barth Bartholomew because Bartholomew was martyred, you know, was slayed. He was Barth he was slayed by the use of a knife there as well. And then we get to Judas, and Judas is the the figure that's in a triangular position in front of Peter, and right in that center there. And Judas, Judas, um, he's lower, he's smaller as a figure there. Um, he is, uh, you know, da Vinci originally, we'll see in the drawings, originally intended to put him on the opposite side of the table, um, but he looks up um, and he's trying to you know, be oblivious to the conversation. Uh, with his left hand, he reaches towards the bowl. With his right hand, he clutches the little sack that holds the, the gold there, and he's alone. He's really more or less isolated. Um, and then John, John is uh, you know, John is the sad one uh, there as well. In group three, Thomas is behind James's shoulder. James, uh, oh, Thomas, he raises his right hand. He raises his finger towards heaven because Thomas was the doubting Thomas who would eventually stick his, his finger in one of Christ's wounds there as well. James the elder, or James the major, you know, starts back in terror. And again, he's, he's his position is like, like that, you know, he's transfixed, his arms are outstretched. He, be he beholds with his eyes and in his motions what his ears have heard. Um, and so you have that, that look of horror. So it's, it's just that understanding. Philip um, lays his hands on his chest and he says, as if he is to say, it is not me, Lord, it is not I. Thou knows my pure heart, it is not I. And then we get to the last group, which is very, very, um, you know, just notice the way that their hands are moving. Um, so you have Matthew who turns his face in the opposite direction. So again, you have this manipulation of the body and the face. Um, towards, he turns to talk to his two companions. He stretches out his right hand towards Christ, um, which also serves as a connecting element to uh, the other group. And, um, you know, he's then talking to Thaddeus. Thaddeus shows surprise and doubt, again, with his hands up. He has the suspicion in his face. His left hand is on the table. His right hand is like, like what's going on here. And almost as if he's extending to strike out at someone. Um, and he said, you know, it's almost as if he's saying, did I not tell you so? He had his suspicions. And then you have Simon, the oldest of the group who sits at the, at the end of the table. Simon is seated with, you see his, almost his whole entire figure. He's dressed in, 
in, in garments with very rich folds and garments there. His face shows that he's very troubled. And again, he's part of this conversation. So this, it, you know, the whole basis of this composition is, is that um, uh, Da Vinci, to, oh, so let me just go back there. If you take a look at Christ's hands and you see, you look at his right hand, which is like that. His right hand is going for the bowl. And whereas, whereas um, uh, Judas's left hand is going for the bowl. So they're reaching, they're reaching for the same bowl at the same time. The other thing you should know about is that it is not only it is an indication of, of an instant or moment in time and characters and emotions and all of that, but the setting and the setting is it's you know it's set the the table is set with a richly embroidered cloth. You have the bread as well as the, you know the dishes and and you know part of the service of the bread and the wine there. So it's all of these symbolic elements there as well. So he used all of these new ideas that hadn't been used, uh, you know. So it was an artistic convention there as well. So we get to to John and the Da Vinci Code, and so John's figure, who is right next. Oops, go back, go back, and I, I'll complete that thought. If you notice the relationship between John and Christ that forms a V, that the point of the base of the V down there as well points to Christ's hand, who is then reaching for the bowl. So you have that as well. But you have in, uh, you know, you have a very youthful John. Um, and so it wasn't an, un, un, you know, an uncommon thing to picture youth almost as if they had feminine, uh, you know, feminine look, a feminine look about them. Next, please. Dave. Okay, so what happened? So in, 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 in the summer of 1943, there was an allied bombing campaign in Milan. And so the Church of the Santa Maria della Grazia, primarily all of the outbuildings were destroyed. If you take a look up at the left-hand photograph, the church itself is the long nave and the dome. The buildings to the right are the cloister, the refectory, and all of that. And that was what was bombed primarily bombed out, which you can see in the black and white image uh, to its right. If you look below the two images there below, the, is, is the, the black and white image is the devastation that was done to the refractory. The only way that the, the Last Supper painting was saved is that sandbags and all kinds of protection were built, you know, were built in front of the wall. So the wall did not come down. However, after the bombing, the, the, you know, the, it was just such a horrific sight that there was tarps all over it and they really didn't get to help it much for maybe a year afterwards. And the first thing that they were able to do was put another coat of shellac onto the image, which I'll talk about in a second, but put a coat of shellac in order to preserve the image. So in the image on the left, that, that image there is a early 20th century image of the interior of the refectory where you would have seen this very plain structure with paintings that would have been hung on the wall. The image on the right is post, um, post restoration. In 1977, there, there have been so many uh, restorations of the Last Supper and I'll tell you why in a second, but there've been so many that by the time 1977 came around and millions of dollars, there was the ultimate of restorations, it took 20 years. Um, whereas the restorer, um, can't remember her name at the moment, works centimeter by centimeter, scraping off the layers and layers of shellac and paint that had been on that. Next, please. So uh, oh, bef before I get to that, these are some of the, the drawings that are preparatory drawings that uh, da Vinci had done. And if you look at the top left-hand drawing then, his initial impetus was to put Judas at the opposite, the opposite edge of the table. And you see Christ literally pointing towards him. You look at the next, uh, the next image there, you see the circle, that idea, just like the Vitruvian man, this idea of the center of the humanity there. And you see some of the, you know, some of the, the um, facial gestures that he, wa he tried out for his, his apostles. And on the very left-hand side, you see the, 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 Christ, the Christ figure itself. Next, please. Okay, so on the top, the top, the top image is an image that they believe, uh, it was done by John Pietrano in 1520, which was about 10 or 15 years after uh, Da Vinci painted the, painted the Last Supper. And you, they believe that this is the most accurate representation of what the Last Supper would have looked like. Because within 50 years of the initial painting, 
um, restorers started to you know, fix the painting. Why? Because in the manner of bone fresco or true fresco, where a painting is done with watercolor paint on, on slightly damp fresco, fresco or plaster, the, the, the colorant sticks to the plaster. Well, what da Vinci did was that he was trying a new technique. And rather than do bone fresco or good fresco onto the plaster, he worked in tempera. And so what happened is that, you know, tempera is egg, egg plus a colorant. And so what happened is that within a, only a several years, the egg dried and started to flake off flake off the painting. So the restorers kept painting over it and over and over again for the next 400 years. And so you could see by the time, and you can see some of the restorers markings here, but by the time they were able to get down basically to the plaster, the plaster level itself, there was a lot of, of uh, you know, rest restoration, um, uh, you know, like that, that the restorers just kind of took it upon themselves to change things. And so to get it back down to the original composition. And so they believe that this, this copy here up on top is the most accurate of the copies that were done right after da Vinci did his painting. Okay, next. Move on. All right. And then here you have a couple of, of uh, uh, you know, a couple of other renditions of the painting there itself that were done after uh, you know, after uh, the, the painting's completion. Next. Okay, so now we look at the next, probably most well-known painting in the entire world, and that's the, uh, the Mona Lisa. And the Mona Lisa is, uh, is, is an, interesting, uh, an interesting piece here because I'll start off with this little piece at the top there. It's a margin note it's, that was written to, uh, uh, it was written by a man called Agostino Vespucci, that he discovered in a book in a library that was dated in 1503. And it stated that Leonardo was working on a, a portrait of a woman called Lisa del Giacondo. And then, you know, there was a little elementary sketch there. So the story of, of next please, the story of this painting um, says, and according to Vasari, who was the great chronicler of, Re of the Renaissance artists, Leonardo undertook to paint for Francisco del Giacondo, the portrait of Mona Lisa, who, who was Lisa Gerardini, who was the Florentine merchant's wife. And this became a portrait of his wife. And the title of the painting actually um, is spelled Mona in English, but in, in Italian, traditionally it was spelled M-O-N-N-A, um, <clears throat> but it's rare in English there as well. So what do we see? So we see a young woman that is you know, sitting facing us with not quite a three quarter view, but she's, she's her gaze is faced on the observer. The woman appears alive. She's a fairly uh, you know, large size of woman. Um, so he achieved this, Leonardo achieved it by not drawing any outlines of her, but he, he used a lot of soft blending, which is called um, sfumato. And it, it um, you know, particularly in the corners of the mouth and the corners of the eyes. So he really softened up the the, uh, the features of the face. He creates a profile view, um, again, which we saw in his earlier, um, uh, the lady with the ermine and the uh, Genevra de Benci. And the woman is portrayed to be seated in what appears to be an open loggia or an open, like a little a deck or something with a dark, you can hardly see them, but there's a dark pillar on each side. And those dark pillars would have come from, you know, looking at some Flemish paint where they enclosed uh, portraits within a within a painting within a painting there within a painting backdrop there, and so in the background you see winding paths, you see a bridge, um, and you see very little indication of a human presence. Um, so there's no real horizon line, but again, it's this magical mystery, some, you know, atmospheric kind of a background, and it, he links the background, the sfumato in the background. Um, you know, with all this soft tone, by the way, he approached the painting, painting, uh, you know, painting uh, um, uh, uh, La Giaconda itself. Now take a look at her hands. And you see her hands, she is ostensibly married, but she's not wearing a wedding ring. But her right hand rests on her left. So he, Leonardo chose this gesture, rather than a wedding ring to, to depict Lisa, Mona Lisa as a virtuous woman. You go back to the idea of a virtuous woman, look at her face and the broad forehead that she has, 
that is covered with just the slightest of a netting uh, over her head. And then you look down at um, you know, you look down at the hands, you look down at these very opulent robes. So that tells us that she was from a woman of worth, that so she was a, uh, you know, from a woman of substance, from a family of wealth. And her husband was a wealthy Florentine merchant. Um, and then, you know, you have this, you know, she's sitting in a chair and her left arm is resting on the chair. And again, this very soft, relaxing pose. And, you know, this, this whole pose itself creates the sense of being and it's infused with the realism of who she is. Um, it's the iconic, you know, that iconic view. Um, so now we look, we look to the 20th century and the 21st century here. And so, you know, it's, it's apparent that she really has no eyebrows. Well, apparently 2007, a, a, a French, um, a, you know, scientist, it used a ultra, ultra high resolution scan of the painting that provided evidence that Mona Lisa had eyelashes and eyebrows. But these were grad, these gradually disappeared over time and perhaps because of the over cleaning over time itself. Um, and he also discovered as he was going through these x-ray layers that the painting had been reworked several times similar to the, to the Last Supper. And <clears throat> he also noticed as he went through that in her hair he found that there was numerous hairpins holding the hair back. In 2003, another professor uh, talked about the smile and she said, the smile disappears, Mona Lisa's smile disappears when observed with direct vision. And that's known as foveal because the way the human eye process, you know, looks at um, uh, processes visual information, it's less suited to pick up shadows directly but from the sides, it picks up the shadows. Um, and then in another, in another research in 2008, looked at the backdrop of the background. And even though it's magical and myst mystical, um, a, a geomorphology professor and revealed likenesses of the landscapes to be found in the red regions of Pissarro, which is up in the north, and Urbino, again, up in the north, and Rimini, up in the northwest at all. But it's the, of these portraits that, uh, you know, da Vinci made, this is the only portrait that the authenticity of the sitter could not be questioned um, because it was thoroughly documented. Uh, um, so, you know, the, again, the, this, this uh, painting and Vasari and some of the contemporary critics, they talked about this painting being such a beautiful likeness, particularly Vasari, such a beautiful likeness that, uh, you know, that there was no question that it was who she is. And she, you know, really compelled, uh, you know, compelled the viewer to look at her. However, the La Giaconda, as, as it was called, was basically rejected by the, uh, you know, by the, by the client for many years. Okay, let's move on. Uh, okay, so now the followers. So there's several followers, followers that are documented that are believed to have been made in Leonardo's studio by his assistants, by his attendants, during the same time that Leonardo was painting the Mona Lisa. And so the, the Prado, the Prado, uh, the Prado one is in the one in the center. And that was believed to be a by you know an assistant and it is believed to be a sister and for many many years until it was restored if you look to the image to the right it had a dark background and so when all of it all the background was cleaned it you know revealed this luxurious background very similar to leonardo's background uh background there <clears throat> as well let's look at the mona vanna uh or nude mona lisa uh, it's a charcoal drawing. And again, it's, it was attributed to Leonardo's studio um, in the 20th century. But then there's always questions. You know, they're trying to establish through scientific research who did it and, you know, an analysis and all these experts, uh, you know, so they come down to, well, it could have been done by one of his assistants or it could have been done by Leonardo had participated in the drawing of itself. So basically it comes to, quote, we are sure of nothing. And if Leonardo participated, it's not all for the drawing, but for some parts of it. So, you know, so again, it's all of these you know, things, things come down to, we don't really know who did it. And then we have the Mona Vanna again, um, but again, the hatching, the hatching on top of this drawing, you know, it's a face and that little smirk of the face there as, as well. There's always less some, uh, you know, some uh, queries in people's mind. Go to the next one, please. And then we have the influence that he, that the Mona Lisa inspired other artists 
to create. And the most, uh, the most delicate of which is by Raphael, who created the drawing uh, you know, of a young, young virginous woman. And then we have the, 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 the next one here. Again, it's the same, the same pose, the same outlook. The young woman is sitting behind a very dull type of a background. But again, with these two pillars, which were not very obvious in the, in the Mona Lisa, she's holding a unicorn, a, my, a mythological animal representative of Christ. She's a virtuous woman. Look at her hair. She's wealthy. Look at her jewelry and her garments. And then we have Baldassaro Castiglione, who you know did a wealthy, um, a wealthy aristocrat in very much the same pose. So you know this idea of the composition being used by various artists, you know, again was was reflective of his his uh, stature, uh, Da Vinci stature. Go ahead, next please. The Virgin of Saint Anne and the Christ Child. Uh, and, and with the Christ child and young St. John the Baptist. Now there's two paintings. And again, they were done within a 10 year framework of itself. First is the cartoon on the left, which means the preparatory drawing for a painting, which was never realized. Um, and it's a large painting on brown paper that uses the brown paper and the textures of the brown paper as part of its values, the lights and darks of the brown, because he worked on it in charcoal and chalk. And he chose in the drawing, he chose several sections to be left unfinished. If you look at the background, you can see vague outlines of uh, you know, the, the landscape in the background as, as well. Um, and if you look at the one on the right, um, there is a, there's a couple of basic differences there. Basically, it's the same, uh, you know, it's the same composition in the pyramidical form. But if you look at Mary, in the first one, Mary is standing or sitting erect. She's so she's holding the Christ child who is then blessing, <clears throat> you know, blessing the little, uh, you know, the little follower of the little angel to the to the right there. If you look at Anne, who is Mary's mother, you see her hand is pointing up to the heavens, which again, this becomes part of the passion, the foreseeing of Christ's future. If you look on the right hand painting, it's a little bit more relaxed. Mary is bending over to hold the Christ child who's holding a lamb. And the lamb is also part of the passion. So replace the hand with the idea of the lamb and you get this idea of the foreboding of the foretelling of Christ's future. And, and you know, contrary to the drawing and to the image of, of Saint Anne there, you see Anne is in much more of a relaxed pose because she has her left hand on her head. And so, the idea of this is that Mary is offering her child to the world, and he in turn offers his blessing in the form of a gesture on the left or holding, you know, holding the lamb on the right there as well. So in both of these paintings, you see the, the absolute presence of strong anatomy. Um, you, you know, you see the presence that, uh, you know, that Leonardo strove for perfection as far as composition and structure, and as well as, you know, the, 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 the gestural and the, um, you know, the, the, the visual content of uh, creation there. Okay, when we get down to this last one here, and that is um, Dave. There we go. Oh, the Salvador Mundi. And the Salvador Mundi um, was until fairly recently unknown who was the painter of. But I want to focus your attention on the right first. And the right uh, is showing various axial mosaics or drawings, the top two, uh, from <clears throat> the the Byzantine Christian tradition, and that would be the Christ Pantocrator. The Christ Pantocrator would be in churches with apses at the altar end, and in the apse at the very top would be an image of Christ in judgment. So very often Christ would have his hand up like this, making a judgment sim or a blessing, similar as we saw in the, the previous painting uh, paintings with uh, Christ and St. Anne and the little child figure. And in his left hand, he would be holding the book of law or the Bible. And the reason it would be put at the altar end is that the altar was the holiest place in the church. And as you walked into the church, you, you, you got holier and holier as you went to the altar. And you then, um, you know, you, you then observed the, you know, the procedures of the liturgy. The bottom is a little bit more of an icon, which again is a Christ Pantocrator position. So you have Christ in, in majesty or, or the, you know, the majestic position, again, holding the holy book, again, holding his hand up in um, a blessing. Now, in this particular painting, they don't exactly know its provenance, 
but they think that King Louis the Seventeenth of France is was um, thought to have commissioned this uh, painting after the conquest of Milan in 1499. And so the painting is a painting of Christ or Jesus in the role of savior of the world and master of the cosmos. And so this is reflected through symbolism. His right hand is raised with the two fingers extended as he gives the divine benediction as in the Christ Pantocrates. His left hand holds a crystalline sphere which represents the heavens. And so, you know, so this painting then is was done in 1500 it was at the height of the high renaissance or as the high renaissance was, was beginning but it's an unusual portrait of christ because it's done in a very humanistic fashion as a man in renaissance dress direct, gazing directly out at the viewer and it is also a half-length portrait which was a radical departure from the full-length portraits of the time particularly of christ okay so the, the you know the overall the overall view with the beautiful hair and the hand and the and the gesture and the you know the the vision and the face um, all of that is achieved through sfumato you know this blending of layers of glazes of paint giving this a very soft appearance which lends to a very spiritual quality which invites veneration from the viewer not as an icon but veneration as praying and so it the realism of the face um, you know encompasses an emotionality and expressiveness that is defined by da Vinci himself, his, his acuity with painting and anatomical correctness. And the lightness and the shadow create a sense of depth, which is in contrast with the light emana emanating from the, from the chest itself. So it, what it tells us is that Jesus is a being filled with light, and he's a light-filled being. Okay, so now what's the controversy of this? So the controversy of this um, is that this painting was virtually unknown because they thought the painting, even though it was document, was destroyed somewhere along the line. And in the early 2000s, the painting was discovered, um, was discovered in some, you know, minor collection and, you know, was bought for really a small amount, you know, it was, was not bought for quite a lot of money. It was bought for really uh, not a lot of money. And it was the owner who had purchased the painting who believed it was a da Vinci. And that started perhaps a 10 or 12 year, you know, like preview of documentation of trying to provenance this to da Vinci. And once it was, uh, you know, provenance to or discovered that it was a da Vinci or claimed that it was a da Vinci painting, it was sold twice. Um, the most recent being in um, 2017 to the tune of $450 million to a Saudi Emirate, who now nobody knows where the painting is. They, originally, it was going to be put in the, uh, Abu, what was it, the Abu Dhabi Louvre there as well, but still has never made it. So this painting has formed an enigma for the past 20 years. And it, but it, you know, again, it is one of these paintings that has, um, ha has raised, just like the Mona Lisa, has raised a lot of interest as to why and how he painted it and to now where it, it belongs. So we close with this in the last one. So da Vinci, da Vinci said, you know, da Vinci was a polymath. He was someone whose level of genius encompassed many, many fields from drawing to engineering, um, inventions and paintings and sculpture and architecture and science and music, and math and literature, anatomy, geology, all of that. And he once said, learning never exhausts the mind. And he, he really was exhaustive in his attempts to, you know, his mind was working so fast and his, 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 his uh, diaries and his sketchbooks were so numerous that he uh, has, you know, it, as we saw in the earlier parts, they were timeless, universal. Um, and, and his paintings were enigmatic, such as The Last Supper and the Mona Lisa and The Vitruvian Man. And so he said also that painting is poetry that is seen rather than felt. Um, he invented the sfumato technique, that idea of subtly colored glazes that built up atmosphere and, and gave the subtle shifts of feeling and, and dimension across the human face as well as in you know in the landscapes in the background and, and so when we look at you know these these eyes Mona Lisa's eyes there dozens of experts have really studied the eyes of Mona Lisa to determine the scientific reasons for the effect of 
when we look at her and people say she follows her eyes follow us across the room one is the, one of which the 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 you know the reason that they do that it does is that the three in the three dimensional real world shadows and light on a face shift as our vantage point changes so if you were looking at me and i move and or you move to one side or the other because my eyes are glassine or glowing they they will shift with the light and so in a two-dimensional portrait however it's not the case so consequently we have the perception that the eyes that are staring really straight out are looking at us even though we are not directly in front of the painting so what caused that what created that was leonardo's mastery of shadows and lighting in order to create that phenomenon more pronounced in the mona lisa and then we get to the mona lisa smile which is the most mystical engaging of all the elements of the painting her smile in this work of Leonardo wrote Vasari, there was a smile so pleasing that it was more divine than human. And, he, and Vasari went on to say how Leonardo, ready for this, Leonardo kept the real Lisa smiling during the portrait sessions. She, he kept her merry and put an end to that melancholy that painters often succeed to the portrait. He kept her merry by having like a, a little band of players, musicians in the background playing music so she could be, you know, entertained while her portrait was being painted. But even so, her, her smile, it flickers. And we look that way and the smile lingers in our minds as does the collective mind of humanity. And so in this painting, emotion and motion are touchstones of Leonardo's art. And so it's been intertwined. And so the, the you know, the, the idea of, of the eyes also, the portrait uh, is Leonardo's drawing of himself as an old man. And look at his eyes and the things that he must have seen, you know, over the course of his life, seen and observed and drew and thought about and meditated. He said at one point that he would sit at night or lay in the bed at night meditating on problems and how to solve them and how to achieve certain light aspects, you know, three-dimensional or two-dimensional or compositional aspects. And then he would go to them. And, and in, the, in the other, you know, with the, that site of intellectual curiosity, he also was able to definitively define how to draw correct perspective, both within the human body and within uh, in, within uh, landscape and landscape perspective. So with that, I leave you. I hope that perhaps I didn't blab on too much, but I hope that um, you were able to get a little sense of uh, Leonardo and his enigmatic, uh, his enigmatic style and his, his devotion to the natural world. And, um, you know, he just didn't have enough time to do everything that he wanted to do.